Hello everyone and welcome to another recorded lecture of Anatomy and Physiology 1 online. Today we'll talk about chapter 8 which is on the skeletal system. So last time we spoke about bone tissue and how bones are developed, how they're remodeled. Now we'll talk about how the bones all fit together uh, to form the human skeleton. And the skeleton is divided into two regions, the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. And the axial skeleton here is shown in white. That includes the skull, all the vertebrae, and the thoracic cage. The axial skeleton also includes the auditory ossicles and the hyoid bone. So it basically forms the central supporting axis of the body, right? It's the head and stick of a stick figure. The axial skeleton is also important for protecting essential organs. So when you think about it, our skulls protecting our brain, our vertebrae are protecting our spinal cord, our thoracic cage is, is uh, protecting our heart and lungs. So the axial skeleton has uh, a protective function as well. The appendicular skeleton includes bones of the upper limb. So it's the limbs, the appendages, the lower limbs, and their attachments. So basically what this means is the appendicular skeleton consists of appendages, like the upper limbs and the lower limbs, and their connectors. We call this the pelvic girdle that holds the lower limbs in place. And up here, this is called the pectoral girdle, which holds the upper limbs into place. So again, the appendicular skeleton is our shoulder bones, our arm bones, our hand bones, and also our pelvic bones, our leg bones, and our foot bones. And while we are born with about 270 bones, many of them fuse together. So in an adult skeleton, the average adult will have around 206 bones. And again, there are some exceptions. Um, some bones fuse in individuals where others do not. So pause here and answer this rapid response question. So let's start discussing some anatomical features of bones. So bones feature a variety of different markings, and it is very important to know the names of some of these bone markings as we discuss the musculoskeletal system um, and all the joints, because a lot of these markings are locations on which muscles attach to. Other um, markings are places where joints form. So as we discuss joints and muscles, it's very important to understand some of these features of bones. And the book goes into a lot of detail about it, but I want you to memorize only what's contained in the slides primarily. Of course, I encourage you to learn everything and to learn every detail in the book, but you will only be tested on what's presented in this lecture. So the head of a bone is a rounded projection on top that forms part of a joint. So here's the head of the femur, head of the humerus, Right, so the head is what usually forms part of a joint. Right, it's the prominent expanded end of a bone. Then we have a condyle, and a condyle is like a rounded bump or like a rounded knob at the end of some bones that articulate or form joints with fossae of another bone. So let me explain. Here are condyles, so these are just rounded bumps right? And those can articulate with those form joints with fossae. And fossae, a fossa for singular, is a shallow depression in a bone surface that condyles articulate with. So we said a condyle is a rounded knob that articulates with another bone. And a fossa is a shallow uh, basin for that condyle to articulate with. Epicondyles are expanded regions superior to a condyle. So you can see over here, um, this is the medial condyle of the femur. Um, and these are helping muscles attach to the bone. Right, these are helping our muscles attach to bone. Um, also, what helps muscles attach to bone are tuberosities. So tuberosity is a large rounded projection that may look like a raised bump. So here we have a tuberosity on the humerus. And this tuberosity um, is a larger version of a tubercle. A tubercle is a small rounded process 
that's smaller than a tuberosity, but both have similar functions. Both are going to be attachment points for muscles. So some other features you should know about include crests. And a crest is just like a narrow ridge on a bone. So here's another crest, a narrow ridge. We have spines. Like you look at the spine of the scapula over here. And a spine is sharper. Um, it's a sharp, slender process. And this is the posterior of the spine. You can feel this. Uh, you can feel your scapula. You can feel the spine of your scapula just by palpating your back. Uh, tubercles, I mentioned, uh, are locations where, again, muscles can help attach to. Um, so we can say this, this is the greater tubercle of the humerus. Um, and then finally, processes is kind of a general term of any bony prominence, anything that sticks out. Um, so this is the mastoid process of the skull. So it's good to just have a brief um, understanding of what these different bone markings are and what their functions are. So as you start studying the bones, I really suggest using yourself as a 3D model. So as we discuss each bone, point to the bone on yourself. If you have um, your app out, if you have your iPad or your um, an iPhone available, I highly suggest using the Complete Anatomy app while you're looking at this lecture. Um, so you can get a 3D feel for what bones we're talking about. And there's two ways to study bones. You can study an articulated skeleton. Those are the ones you see in a lab that are dried bones together. Um, they're all held together by wires as they would be in a skeleton, in a regular human. So you can see how the different bones relate to each other. But in lab, we'd also look at disarticulated bones, which are bones taken apart. So you can see their individual markings a lot better. So again, as we go through this lecture, try to palpate, try to feel many of the bones and some of their details through your own skin. And you're gonna gain the most from this chapter if you're conscious of your own body in relation to what you're studying. So that's the best advice I can give you. Now let's talk about the skull. So the most complex part of the skeleton is the skull. And let's start by talking about the cranial bones. And the cranial bones um, compose the cranium, which encloses the brain. Right, so here is the cranium. Let's start by talking about the frontal bone. Uh, we have one frontal bone. It extends from the forehead uh, back to the coronal suture. So from the forehead to this suture we call the coronal suture, which attaches the frontal bone to the parietal bones. And we have a right and left parietal bones. These form most of the cranial roof and part of its walls. And like I mentioned, we have this suture, this coronal suture at the anterior margin that allows the parietal bones to attach to the frontal bone. At the posterior margin of the parietal bone, we have the lambdoid suture, the lambdoid suture, which helps the parietal bones connect with the occipital bone. So the occipital bone forms the rear of the skull and much of its base. Um, and we'll have the occipital lobe of the brain is where the visual cortex resides. So again, it's important to know the names of these bones because a lot of the um, organs and muscles have names that correspond to the bones. So once you know the bone names, everything else becomes a lot more easy to understand. So it's worthwhile to memorize these things. So we said the frontal bone, coronal suture, parietal bones, lambdoid suture, occipital bone. Um, okay, so that's that. And now we can move on to the temporal bones. So the temporal bones, um, you can feel them very easily. They form the lower wall and part of the floor of the cranial cavity. And if you touch your skull right above your ear, like right above your ear, that's your temporal bone. Right. So this is the temporal bone. Um, we have some important parts that we'll talk about um, in a bit, like the mastoid, pro the mastoid process, styloid process, 
and the external acoustic meatus, those are very important aspects of the temporal bone. So we'll talk about that in a bit. The sphenoid bone is quite interesting. So the sphenoid bone is a very complex looking bone um, and it has a lot more clarity. You can see it a lot more clearly with a different view of the skull. So I'm gonna show you a, uh, a superior view and a posterior view of the sphenoid bone in a subsequent slide. But you can see just from this right lateral view of the skull, here's the sphenoid bone. And the sphenoid bone is right by your, your temples. If you feel like your temples, that's where your sphenoid bone is. And again, it has like a butterfly shape uh, on the inside. So next we have the ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone is an anterior cranial bone that's located between the eyes. And this contributes to part of the walls of the orbit, meaning the eye socket. Um, also has uh, contributes to the walls of the nasal cavity and the nasal septum. So the ethmoid bone is very delicate um, and very porous. And we'll see it plays a role in um, olfaction, meaning the sense of smell. So, so far, I think we covered most of the cranial bones. Um, let's just visit some of the specific portions of the temporal bone really quickly before we move on to the facial bones. So we have the external acoustic meatus, also known as the ear canal, right? So that's part of, that's included as part of the temporal bone. So you should know that. We also have the mastoid process that lies just posterior uh, to the external acoustic meatus. And the mastoid process, you can feel as like a lump right behind the earlobe, right? You can, you can, I'm feeling mine right now. It's like a little bump right behind the earlobe. And that's this mastoid process. Um, these actually have some sinuses inside uh, that have a, an ability to communicate with the middle ear cavity. Uh, finally, another part I should mention is the styloid process. The styloid process is a point of attachment for tongue, the pharynx, and also the hyoid bone. So the styloid process serves as a point of attachment. Um, and again, this would be considered a process because it just sticks out of the bone. So to recap, we said we have the frontal bone, parietal bones, those are connected by the coronal suture, the lambdoid suture, um, is at the posterior margin of the parietal bone and it helps link the occipital bone. We have the sphenoid bone and the temporal bones. The temporal bones include certain prominences like the styloid process, the mastoid process, and then we have this um, canal of the external acoustic meatus. And then we have the ethmoid and the, the sphenoid bones, uh, which form help form sinuses. So those are the cranial bones. Um, I should mention the nasal bone. This is a nice view of the nasal bone, which is considered a facial bone. And that forms the bridge of the nose, right? And of course, this will help support the hyaline cartilage that helps shape the lower portion of the nose. Now I'd like to show you um, lateral and superior views of the skull together. So you just get more of an orientation. So here's the frontal bone. You feel your frontal bone now. Now touch your parietal bones. I didn't mention this suture called the sagittal suture. That's important. The sagittal suture is what connects both parietal bones. The coronal suture we see over here. Then we have the occipital bones. Well, there's one occipital bone per skull. And the lambdoid suture is what connects the occipital bone to the parietal bones. We have the temporal bone. The sphenoid, you can't see in the anterior, in the uh, superior portion. And then, of course, that nasal bone. And here's a medial section where you can see the sphenoid sinus a lot more clearly. And this is a space. It's an empty space in the skull. Right? We also have a frontal sinus. Again, this is, a sinus is a space. And I'll show you that in another um, in a slide coming up. This is a really nice view of the sphenoid bone over here. Um, and an interesting part of the sphenoid bone is called the cella tersica. The cella tersica. Uh, 
And the cell tersica has like a deep pit, which houses the pituitary gland, which is part of the brain. We'll talk about that a lot more um, when we discuss the nervous system. Uh, part of the occipital bone that's notable is the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum. And the foramen magnum is a passageway. Any foramen is just a hole, like a, pa a passageway for the spinal cord. So that's where the spinal cord can connect to the brain. And again, there's a lot more I could talk about and I'd love to discuss, but for the sake of time, um, I'm going to go through this rather quickly. So the skull has several holes in it called foramina. A foramen, right? We said a singular. Foramina is multiple uh, holes. And we need uh, very small foramina for nerves and blood vessels to pass through. So we see foramina all over the place in the skull. Uh, the foramen magnum was a huge uh, space in the occipital bone that allowed for passageway of the spinal cord. But let's talk about sinuses. So paranasal sinuses are air-filled spaces in the skull. We have the frontal sinus. We have the sphenoid sinus, which you can't see here, but that's in the sphenoid bone. We have the ethmoid sinus and the ethmoid bone. And we have maxillary sinuses by the maxilla. And these are all lined by mucous membranes meaning so they have pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, and they're air-filled. The reason why we need these is they lighten the skull, right? It gives us air space so we lighten the skull, um, and they act as chambers that add resonance to the voice. So if you have a sinus infection, you have a very different uh, voice uh, because it's filled with fluid sometimes or mucus. So here's an image of a frontal section of the human head. And you can see a lot of the major cavities of the skull and their contents. So we can see here is the maxillary sinus, not right, just the space, the nasal cavity, right? The frontal sinus, um, these nasal conchi we'll talk about in a bit. So there are a lot of spaces, right? The oral cavity. Um, so it's important to remember that the, the head is not just like a solid mass of stuff. There are spaces. So now let's discuss the ethmoid bone, which we said is located between the eyes, and it contributes to the medial wall of the orbit. Right? This is the medial wall of the orbit. This is the lateral wall of the orbit. It also helps form the roof of the nasal cavity and part of the nasal septum. So there's some important parts to the ethmoid. The perpendicular plate forms the superior two thirds of the nasal septum right up here. We then have the cribriform plate. The cribriform plate forms the roof of the nasal cavity. The cribriform plate. The cristagalli is like a blade that serves as an attachment for dura mater. And dura mater is one of the meninges of the skull. So this is a gateway, right? This is an attachment point to the brain. And the cribriform foramina the cribriform foramina are these little dots, these little spaces um, that allow fascicles of the olfactory nerve to reach the olfactory bulb in the brain. So we have lots of receptors, um, but these are really, these are called fascicles that all travel. They detect any molecules, um, any scent molecules, any odors, and they can transmit that signal through these little holes Right, the nerves go through the holes to the olfactory bulb of the brain. So the nasal cavity is actually directly connected to the brain. These neurons are exposed to the brain. So again, those have to come through so they could reach the nasal, uh, they could reach the olfactory bulb in the brain. And olfaction just means smell. Nasal conchi are these kinds of scroll-like plates that have air in them. They help humidify air, um, and they occupy most of the nasal cavity. So as we continue talking about facial bones, we're talking about skull bones that are anterior to the cranial cavity, right? They're in front. They do not enclose the brain like the cranium, right? The cranial bones, the cranial bones enclose the brain. The facial bones 
support our teeth, they give shape to our faces, and they help form part of the orbital and nasal cavities. I mentioned the nasal bones and the nasal conchi already, uh, but now I'll talk about the other facial bones. So we here, just to give us, you know, some kind of bearing, here's the frontal bone. There's the nasal bone. We have two nasal bones. Then we have the maxilla. The maxilla. So we have not one, but two maxillae, right? So this is a maxilla. This is a maxilla. These are the largest of the facial bones. And they form the upper jaw. And they meet at this little... A suture called the intermaxillary suture. So they look like one bone, but they're actually two bones that are connected. Um, and we have, this helps support our teeth. So the maxilla is important um, because the root of each tooth is inserted into a deep socket of the maxilla. Uh, then we have the mandible. The mandible is the strongest bone of the skull, and it's the only facial bone that could really move a lot. So the mandible is, um, again, helps support our lower teeth and is our jaw. So it helps us chew, right? Mastication is the process of chewing. It also helps muscles attached to it to help us have facial expressions. So the mandible plays a role in facial expression. So there we have the mandible. We'll talk about um, the temporomandibular joint um, in a bit when we talk about mastication. Now we have the zygomatic bone or the cheekbones. The zygomatic bones um, form the angles of the cheeks. So we have two zygomatic bones, right, cheekbones. Uh, you can see the sphenoid bone uh, in this angle a little bit. If you took out the eyes, you can see that posterior um, to the eyeball, you can see the sphenoid. And similarly, you can see the ethmoid, part of the ethmoid bone here, shown in green. So I want to make sure I got through most of the thing. The vomer I could talk about now as well. And the vomer forms the inferior half of the nasal septum. Uh, so the superior half of the nasal septum we said is, is formed by the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, right? So together the vomer and the perpendicular plate support that cartilage that forms the nasal septum. And here's just an up close look at the mandible. And uh, you'll notice these mandibular condyles um, articulate with the temporal bone to allow for chewing and talking and all other things that utilize our jaw. Uh, the body of the mandible is what supports the teeth. Right? Uh, we call this the ramus. This is the ramus. And then the angle connects the body to the ramus. So by looking at this view of the nasal cavity, we can finish talking about the facial bones. We have two palatine bones that divide the oral and nasal cavities from each other. So this palatine bone forms part of the palate along with the maxilla, right? So together those form the, the hard palate. Um, so it's about the horizontal plates of the palatine bone form the posterior one third of the bony palate. So we have two of those uh, palatine bones. We also have lacrimal bones, which I didn't mention. Uh, lacrimal bones form part of the medial wall of each orbit. So it's a little hard to see because they're so small. And tears from the eye collect in this little sac that's found in the bone, and they drain into the nasal cavity. So the lacrimal duct carry tears right, um, to the nasal cavity. So the nasal lacrimal duct we'll discuss um, in a bit. So I'll just show you a picture of the lacrimal bone here shown in red, right by the tear ducts. That the lacrimal bone is right there. It's about the size of a fingernail. So it's pretty, pretty small. Um, and there again, another a better view of the sphenoid si uh, sinus. You can see that nice space. Uh, here's the nasal cartilage. 
And remember, the vomer and the nasal bones form part of the scaffolding that the nasal cartilage can hold on to. So I think we spoke about all of the facial bones. We spoke about the maxillae, the palatine bones, zygomatic bones, lacrimal bones, nasal bones, the nasal conchi, the vomer, and the mandible. So I'd like you to watch um, the video contained in the ebook uh, to review uh, everything we spoke about so far about the skull. So this will walk you through each bone in three-dimensional space. And also, I like this aspect, that you can see the sphenoid bone in a lot more clarity. Right? You can see that cella tersica. You can see where the ethmoid bone fits in, that perpendicular plate, the cristagalli. There's the palatine bones. And again, you can see that forms the hard palate and part of the nasal cavity. So I like this video, and there's a lacrimal group, because this shows you the inside. Right, this shows you more um, with more accuracy what's really going on inside. So we have bones that are closely associated with the skull, but are not considered part of it. So we have auditory ossicles, these three little bones called the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, um, that are in each middle ear cavity. So these auditory ossicles um, are associated with the skull, but are not attached to it. We also have the hyoid bone, which is a slender U-shaped bone between the chin and the larynx. And the hyoid bone is a free floater. It doesn't articulate with any other bone. Uh, it's kind of suspended from the styloid process of the skull, almost like a hammock, because um, it has these ligaments that hold it up, kind of like a hammock, right? These are these the muscles and the ligaments. Um, and the point of the hyoid bone is because it helps attach muscles that control the larynx, tongue, and the mandible. So the hyoid is a, an attachment point for several muscles that control the mandible, tongue, and the larynx. And a forensic pathologist would look for a fractured hyoid as evidence of strangulation. So if they're trying to figure out the cause of death, they can look at a uh, look at the hyoid. And if it's fractured, that means that the victim has been strangled to death. So I just opened um, my 3D skeleton, which you can do on your own with the app. And again, it's just important to be able to click around and be able to identify the bone. So what am I pointing to right here? You should be able to lock your answer in and know that it is the sphenoid bone. And know what each bone connects to. So what is this? All right, it's the temporal bone. What is this? The parietal bone, right? And of course you should know the lambdoid suture, um, the sagittal suture, coronal suture, and then we could look at the zygomatic bones, the cheekbones. It's, it's really important to look at these kinds of models to see how each bone is in isolation, right? Here are our two maxillae. They're shown that they're fused. Alrighty, so this is the maxilla. We have two nasal bones. The vomer is going to be hard to see um, over here, but we can dissect that away. Over here, you have a beautiful view of the lacrimal bones. All right, trying to grab that guy. Um, the mandible. Um, uh, you can see the styloid process and the mastoid process of the temporal bone here. Um, and what I can do is try to dissect away. Actually, can I do that here? I don't know if I could. In the, I can hide the nasal bone. I can hide this. And you can see the sphenoid bone a lot more clearly. And again, I could keep on, I could cut away the ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone is uh, very nicely seen uh, from the superior view. Now you can see all those foramina. All the crystagalli. Um, and again, this is also a nice uh, view of the skull and all the sutures for all the cranial bones.
So this should be a good overview of the skull. So now let's talk about the vertebral column, AKA the spine. The spine supports the skull and the trunk and allows for both of their movement. It also protects the spinal cord and it absorbs stresses of movements as we're walking, running, and lifting. The spine also provides an attachment for limbs, right? The thoracic cage and muscles that help us, uh, help us with posture, right? Um, sometimes we like to call the spine the backbone, but it's not just one bone. It's actually a flexible chain of 33 vertebrae, which um, with intervertebral discs between them. And these intervertebral discs are made up of fibrocartilage. And these fibrocartilage help um, resist any stress, right? So again, it it's, uh, absorbs the stresses of the movements. During the day, our discs compress a bit due to the pressure of the body weight. So at, when we go to sleep at night, we're actually a little shorter uh, because of all the pressure we put on um, just because of gravity. So what is a vertebra? Right, we said we have 33 of these vertebrae. Um, each vertebra is an irregular bone in shape, and these bones are found in all vertebrate animals. We have a foramen in the middle of each vertebra. What do you think goes through here? What goes through the vertebral foramen? Right. That will be the spinal cord. Right? The spinal cord goes through the vertebral foramen. The body of the vertebra is the weight bearing portion. So that could withstand the most weight. Um, and it has red bone marrow on the inside of it. So it's spongy boned. You can kind of see the spongy bone. I wish I could pass one around in class. Um, and it has a shell of compact bone. So this supports a lot of the weight of the spine. The rough surfaces of the spongy bone attaches um, the intervertebral discs, almost acts like a, like a porous adhesion site. So the intervert the fibrocartilage can stick to that spongy bone. We said the vertebral foramen um, forms the vertebral canal and the spinal cord can go through it. The vertebral arch uh, composes a few different parts. The pedicle, is the pillar, it's pillar-like, so you call this the pedicle, and we call the lamina this plate part. So each vertebral arch consists of a pedicle and the lamina, that's the arch. Pedicle, pedicle, lamina, lamina. Uh, extending through the apex of the vertebral arch, we have the spinous process. The spinous process is directed posteriorly toward the back and downward. And if you, you could look at the spine of a back of a, you could look at the back of anybody and you can see the spinous processes as the row of bumps along the spine. Finally, we have the transverse process that projects from the arch laterally. Right? So they're transverse because they go laterally uh, and they, extend laterally from the point where the pedicle and the lamina meet. And the transverse process is very important because this is where ligaments, ribs, and muscles attach to, right? So these are points of attachments for ligaments, ribs, and muscles. We can divide the vertebral column into different regions. Uh, we start with the atlas and the axis are always the first two vertebra, vertebrae. Um, so the first seven vertebrae are considered the cervical vertebrae because they're by the neck. So the cervical vertebrae, we have seven of those. We name them C1 through C7. So C1 and C2, C1 is always the atlas, C2 is always called the axis, but C1 through C7 are the cervical vertebrae. We then have 12 thoracic vertebrae, right? and those articulate with ribs. 
So the thorax, right, think of the thoracic cage is the rib cage. So the thoracic vertebrae articulate with the ribs. We then have five lumbar vertebrae in the lower back. These are very thick. They have a very thick body because they have to withstand a lot of stress. And then we have sacral vertebrae uh, that are labeled S1 through S5. In adults, these appear as one fused bone. Um, and then finally, we have four tiny coccygeal vertebrae that make up the coccyx or the tailbone. Uh, a way to remember this, um, uh, a student told me this once actually, is there are seven vertebrae, 12 thoracic and five lumbar because you can eat breakfast around 7 a.m., you have lunch around 12, and then you have dinner around 5 p.m. I definitely don't eat on that schedule, but uh, I guess some people did historically. So you can remember seven, 12, five. Um, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral. So for proper posture, it is very important that our spine has a proper curvature. Um, and shown in green is the normal healthy curvature that we'd expect of the spine. And each region um, has its own unique curvature. But there are defects in this. Um, one you might have heard of is scoliosis. Right. Um, and scoliosis is common in uh, young adolescent girls. It could sometimes result from a developmental abnormality in which the body and arch fail to develop on one side of the vertebra. Um, and it's possible that if it's caught early enough, scoliosis could be corrected with the back brace. There are also two other types of abnormal spinal curvatures. We have kyphosis, which is a hunchback, and that's where it's exaggerated thoracic curvature. Right by the thorax, it, re it looks like a hunchback. Right? So we have one form of an abnormal spinal curvature called kyphosis. Um, and again, that's because it's bending anteriorly. It's bending in the front. It's, so that means it's curved outward toward the back. The other type of abnormal spinal curvature you should be familiar with is called lordosis, which is a bend toward the front. And that's because you have exaggerated lumbar curvature. So it's a sway back, the sway back. So these are, again, we have scoliosis, which is abnormal lateral curvature. Then we have kyphosis, which is a hunchback. And then we have kyphosis, which is a sway back. So starting with the cervical vertebrae, let's start with C1 and C2. So C1 is called the atlas. And the atlas supports the head. The atlas is unique in terms of a vertebrae structure because it doesn't have any body. It's just a delicate ring around a very large foramen. The axis, or C2, is also very unique, right? And C2 allows the head rotation gesturing no, right? So the axis allows you to rotate on your axis, right? It allows, and this projects into the vertebral foramen of the atlas. So the axis and the atlas form the atlantoaxial joint, um, and this, again, is allowing for the head to move around. Their function is to support the head movements. I actually just want to mention a certain feature of the axis called the dens or the odontoid process. And no other vertebra has a dens. And this projects into the vertebral foramen of the atlas. And it's held in place by a special transverse ligament. And you might have known this, but a very heavy blow to the top of the head causes a fatal injury because the dens is driven through the foramen magnum into the brain stem. And that again is instant death. If it goes through that hole in the occipital cord and the occipital bone into the brain stem, that's instant death. So that's why banging yourself on the top of the head, right? This thing will basically just penetrate into your brain stem. So we said that vertebrae stack to form the vertebral column. They have intervertebral discs in between that act as shock absorbers that are made up of that fibrocartilage. 
They provide cushioning and flexibility. So intervertebral foramina are passageways for spinal nerves. So you can see in this view, in this lateral view, you can see these intervertebral foramina that allow spinal nerves to exit and to reach throughout the body. And of course, we know as we, uh, the vertebral foramen is what holds the spinal cord, right? As we go from like superior to inferior, right? So the spinal cord is held in the vertebral foramina. These intervertebral foramina are passageways for the spinal nerves, which leave the spinal cord and then penetrate um, other parts of the body. The sacrum is actually composed of five fused sacral vertebrae labeled S1 through S5. They articulate superiorly with L5. This is called the superior articular process. So L5, the lumbar um, vertebra number five would be right here. And inferiorly, we have the coxal bones or the tailbone, right? The tailbone is the most inferior part of the vertebral column that's actually formed of three to five fused coccygeal vertebrae. So here is a video I suggest watching on the vertebral column on the spine. Uh, talks about all the vertebrae. It talks about what a herniated disc is. Um, talks about some other um, injuries that can happen to the spine. So please take the time to watch that. And now you can pause here to answer this rapid response question. So there are five lumbar vertebrae seven cervical vertebrae, and 12 thoracic vertebrae. So the answer is A. So let's take a look here. And here we have C1. I'm gonna try to zoom in a little more. So here is C1, the atlas, which means this is the axis, C2. And remember we label them S, um, C1 through C7. And then what comes next? We have the thoracic. So we label them from T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, T7, T8, T9, T10, T11, T12. And again, this is these are gonna to attach to the ribs. So notice um, how these uh, transverse processes attach to the ribs. Also notice these are the spinous processes that form the back of the spine. Uh, then we have the lumbar, one, two, three, four, five. Those are a lot thicker. If you looked uh, at those centra, the bodies are a lot larger. And then finally, we have the sacrum and the little coccyx, the tailbone. So now let's move on to the thoracic cage. And the thoracic cage consists of the thoracic vertebrae, which we just spoke about, the sternum, and the ribs. And the goal, the function of the thoracic cage is to protect our internal organs. Right? That's very, very important. Um, it also supports the superior trunk, the pectoral girdle, and upper limbs. So it has a protective function and a supporting function as well. So the cage, um, the thoracic cage, not only protects the lungs, but also the spleen, most of the liver, and uh, to some extent, the kidneys. The thoracic cage has a very important role in breathing as well. So it has to rhythmic, rhythmically expand um, by the respiratory muscles to create a vacuum that can draw air into the lungs. And then as it compresses, it will expel, expel the air out. And if we were to talk about the respiratory system, we talk all about gas exchange and how the thoracic cage um, allows for that. The structure of the thoracic cage is we have 12 pairs of ribs that are joined to the thoracic vertebrae at the posterior. So at the back, like I just showed you, um, we saw the thoracic vertebrae, their transverse processes attached to the ribs. And anteriorly, they're joined to the sternum by coastal cartilage at the anterior end. So ribs 
are not directly articulating with the sternum. They have costal cartilage, which is a type of hyaline cartilage um, that allows them to connect. So the sternum is the breastbone, right? And it's a bony plate anterior to the heart. It's right in front of the heart. And the sternum is divided into three parts. The manubrium, the manubrium is, um, has two clavicular notches. That's where the clavicles articulate with. So this is the manubrium right over here. Right. Uh, it's kind of like a, the knot of a necktie. That's what it kind of reminds me of, like the knot of the necktie. Um, and you can e easily feel this between your clavicles. We then have the body, also known as the gladiolus, kind of shaped like a dagger. And the gladiolus lies at the level between T5, the, thora the fifth thoracic vertebrae, and T9. Finally, uh, we have the xiphoid process, which is very small. Um, it's the most inferior portion of the sternum. And this provides the attachment for some of the abdominal muscles. So that's going to become uh, important. So here we have a nice view of the thoracic cage. Uh, we have the manubrium. We have the body. We have the xiphoid process of the sternum. Uh, I didn't mention this before, but these scalloped edges, right, these little um, rough borders, allow the costal cartilage to articulate with it, to, to articulate with the body of the sternum. And we have 12 pairs of ribs, right? And we know each is attached posteriorly to the vertebral column. Most of them are attached anteriorly to the sternum by that costal cartilage. We'll see that's not the case for all of the ribs. Right? Um, so that's the thoracic cage. I'm gonna skip this bit. Um, I don't need you to know all the specific details of uh, the parts of the ribs, but it's good to know. So we have true ribs. Um, so ribs one through seven, one through seven are called true ribs. And that's because each of these true ribs is directly connected to the sternum via costal cartilage. So you hear it's rib one, costal cartilage, this one attaches to the manubrium. Um, two, costal cartilage directly to the sternum, right? Di directly to the sternum, directly to the sternum. So one through six, each has a direct connection to the sternum via costal cartilage. Then we have false ribs. And false ribs are ribs 8 through 12 because those lack independent connections to the sternum. So specifically, two of these false ribs are floating. They have no attachments at all. So ribs 11 and 12 are completely floating ribs. Ribs 8, 9, and 10 do have connections to the sternum, but their cartilage connects with more cartilage. So just note how seven is a true rib because it goes from bone to cartilage, right? But this goes from bone to cartilage to more cartilage to more cartilage. So eight, nine, and 10 are considered false ribs that only connect via cartilage. Ribs 11 and 12 don't have any connections to the sternum at all. They're floating ribs. So we can take a look at the, at the thoracic cage. Here we have the sternum the manubrium, gladiolus, xiphoid process. And then we have our pairs of 12 ribs. We know ribs one through seven are true ribs because they have direct connections. Ribs eight, nine, and 10 do not have, or ribs eight through 12 are all, calls, are all called false ribs because they lack independent cartilaginous connections to the sternum. All right, we said in, uh, ribs eight through 10, the costal cartilage kind of sweeps upward and ends on the costal cartilage of rib seven. So we can't call that a true rib. And ribs 11 and 12 are completely floating. You can see, right, they have no connections at all, 11 and 12. So now we'll move on to the pectoral girdle. And the pectoral girdle or the shoulder girdle supports the arm, 
and links it to the axial skeleton. So the pectoral girdle is part of the appendicular skeleton. And the pectoral girdle consists of two bones on each side of the body. We have a clavicle, which is the collarbone, and the scapula, which is the shoulder blade. And these two are going to be able to hold our upper limbs into place. The clavicle articulates medially to the sternum and laterally to the scapula. So the clavicles, um, again, connect the sternum to the scapula. Those are the collarbones. The scapula articulates with the clavicle and also with the humerus. So again, we're connecting everything together. The pectoral girdles are connectors. So it's important for you to know um, where all these connections are, right? You don't have to know the specific names yet. Um, this is the sternoclavicular joint. This is the glenohumeral joint. Um, you'll have to know specific joints when we talk about the musculoskeletal system. But right now, I want you to just visualize how all these bones connect and how those connections would allow them to maintain a certain structure. So the clavicle is kind of like an S-shaped flattened bone. And this keeps our arms away from the midline, helps keeps our, our shoulders braced. We'll see it's also an attachment for some of the muscles of head movement, like the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius muscle. Um, without the clavicles, the pectoralis major muscles will pull the shoulders forward and medially, which is not uh, what we want, right? We don't want our pectoralis muscle mode to pull our shoulders forward. We need our shoulders to remain back and erect, right? Like flat against the wall. So that's what our clavicles do. They help brace our shoulders. So if I were to move my pectoralis muscles, my pecs, my shoulders are not going to come forward as well. So next up, we have the scapula. And the scapula is named for its resemblance to a shovel. And it looks like a triangular bone. And it overlies ribs two through seven. So there are a couple of um, portions of the scapula that you should be very familiar with. Specifically, um, there are three features you should know about. The acromion. The acromion is a plate-like extension of the scapular spine. So this is the scapular spine and the acromion is an extension of that spine. And this articulates with the clavicle, which can help form the bridge from the appendicular skeleton, which is this, to the axial skeleton, which is part of the clavicle. Right, I should actually specify the clavicle is still part of the appendicular skeleton because it's part of the pectoral girdle, but the pectoral, but the clavicle attaches to the sternum, right? So again, the scapula is helping attach the clavicle to the sternum so we can keep our arms in place. So that's the acromion. And from a posterior view, you can see the acromion uh, sticking out. Then we have the coracoid process. The coracoid process is like a, sh a bent finger, it looks like. So you can see that from the anterior view. And this bent finger is important because this allows the attachment of the tendons for the biceps, uh, the biceps brachii and other muscles of the arm. So the coracoid process is something you should remember. That's, again, this is an anterior view. This is the posterior view. So the coracoid process sticks out anteriorly the acromion sticks out posteriorly. Right. The glenoid cavity is a shallow socket that articulates with the head of the humerus, right, the upper arm. And that's a, we'll talk more about that joint in, uh, when we talk about chapter nine. And then again, the spine is just this, the, the posterior portion. It's a very thin, slender uh, protrusion that's continuous with the acromion. So putting it all together, we have our acromion. We know this must be a posterior view, right? There's the coracoid process, that bent finger. Here's the spine. You can feel your spine and the back of your shoulder. We should try to do that now. Here's an anterior view, and you can see how the clavicle articulates with the acromion. This is part of the pectoral girdle. 
The glenoid, uh, sorry, the glenoid cavity will help form the glenohumeral joint as it forms with the humerus. The glenohumeral joint is the shoulder joint because it connects the humerus with the glenoid cavity, glenohumeral. Um, and then you can see the, this lateral view where you can see the acromion and back. Uh, the coracoid process uh, would be in the anterior and the glenoid cavity, again, is where this humerus will articulate. So let's look at our 3D skeleton and see our scapulae. So we have a right scapula and a left scapula. You can see the spine is very prominent. Right, we know that this is the acromion right up here. Uh, this is a nice angle because you can see the that bent finger, the coracoid process right there. Right, the coracoid process. And that'll be important for the biceps brachii to attach to. So here we have acromion, coracoid process, spine. And notice, like if I show you a picture of a scapula, you should be able to tell me if it's the right scapula or a left scapula, right? So, so just note the orientation. It's very important um, to be able to know right from left when you're looking at bones. And again, the only way to know that is by looking at a 3D skeleton and to test yourself constantly. There's no other way to memorize this. So there's the scapula, you see the clavicles and how it articulates with the acromion of the scapula as part of the pectoral girdle. So, so far we covered the skull, the vertebral column, and the thoracic cage, and the pectoral girdle. Next, we can talk about the upper limbs. So the upper limb is divided into three regions, containing a total of 30 bones per limb. We have the upper arm, or the brachium. The arm proper is uh, extending from the shoulder to the elbow. So when we say the arm or the brachium, right, that's from the shoulder to the elbow. It only has one bone, the humerus. We then have the forearm or the antibrachium that goes from the elbow to the wrist. And that has two bones. We have the radius and the ulna. Finally, we have the carpal region and the metacarpal region of the hand. So the hand consists of 27 bones. So only three Right, we spent the, the humerus, radius, and ulna, plus 27 bones of the hand. And again, the hand can be divided up into the carpal region and the metacarpal region and the phalanges, which are the fingers. So if we divide it up into three, we said the brachium has the humerus, antibrachium, ulna, and radius. The hand has the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges which combines our 27 bones. So let's take a look um, at some of the more detailed aspects of the humerus first. So the humerus, at the proximal end, we have the hemispherical head that can articulate with the glenoid cavity of the scapula, like we just shown. That forms the glenohumeral joint. Other prominent features of the proximal end are the greater and lesser tubercles. The greater and lesser tubercles. Um, this again is going to help muscles attach to it. We also have the deltoid tuberosity. The deltoid tuberosity which is a rough area uh, on the lateral surface that is an insertion for the deltoid muscle of the shoulder. So again, remember a lot of these tuberosity, these bone markings tell you what muscle will attach to it. So the deltoid tuberosity is a point of attachment for the deltoid muscle, right? And it attaches to the humerus. The intertubercular sulcus, intertubercular sulcus is between the greater and lesser tubercles. And this can accommodate a tendon of the biceps muscle. And the reason why I'm telling you all these things now is because when we learn about the biceps, you'll remember, oh, right, that's the intertubercular sulcus. Now at the distal end, 
Uh, we have two condyles that are rather smooth. We have the rounded capitulum. The capitulum is the lateral condyle. The medial condyle is called the trochlea. The trochlea. So we have the capitulum and the trochlea make up the smooth condyles at the ends of the humerus. The capitulum will articulate with the head of the radius. The trochlea, which is the other condyle, will articulate with the ulna. So capitulum with the radius, trochlea with the ulna. And then the lateral and medial epicondyles, you can actually feel those. Those are the bumps you feel at the widest point of your elbow. So I'm feeling that right now. The widest point of your elbow, you can feel these two bumps um, that kind of flare out from the humerus. And the medial epicondyles protect the ulnar nerve. Um, and that epicondyle is known as the funny bone. Because when you strike your elbow on the end of a table, it'll simulate the ulnar nerve and produce a, a tingling sensation. So those are some important parts of the um, humerus. Also the alacranon fossa. The alacranon fossa, remember a fossa is like a groove, holds the alacranon process of the ulna in place. So the alacranon fossa accommodates a process of the ulna called the alacranon when the elbow is extended. So let's talk about the radius next. The radius has a head that is discoidal at the proximal end. And the disc shape is important because it allows for rotation during pronation and supination. What that means is when your forearm is rotated, so like your palm is turning forward and back, that circular surface of the radius, of the, um, the head of the radius, is spinning on the capitulum of the humerus, right? So this disc head allows it to spin for supination and pronation. So right now I want your, you to put your forearm out with your palm facing up, and that is supine, that's supinated. When your palm faces down, that is called pronation. Now your, your palm and forearm is pronated. Um, so we'll talk about how the radius and ulna allow for supination and pronation. We have the radial tuberosity as another important um, prominence on the medial surface of the radius. Um, we'll talk about how the biceps muscle attaches to the radial tuberosity. We then have another process at the distal end called the styloid process, which is a bony point. You can feel that at the edge of your thumb at the base of your thumb, All right? So I'm feeling that right now, that styloid process. Notice there is a styloid process um, also in the occipital lobe. Uh, so again, some of these things are repetitive. I'm oh, sorry, in the um, temporal lobe. So some of these things, again, just are named styloid. Just, it looks like a pen. It looks like a, like a style that was used in ancient Greece. So these things are named according to their shape. We then have the ulnar notch. The ulnar notch articulates, the ulnar notch is part of the radius, just to note, right? That's a little tricky. The ulnar notch is part of the radius that can articulate with the ulna, right? So the ulnar notch is part of the radius that can accommodate the head of the ulna, and that's what allows them to articulate together. So the ulna um, is the other bone of the antebrachium. Uh, the way to know the, which one is the uh, ulna versus the radius is if you put your thumb, your right thumb up, let's put your thumb up right now, like thumbs up, the radius is on top. The radius is closest to the thumb on both sides. So if you put your thumb up, the radius is on top. So over here, we have the olecranon the olecranon, which is the bony point of your elbow. Like if you're putting your elbow down on a table, you're putting the olecranon against the surface. We have the radial notch of the ulna holds onto the head of the radius. 
The trochlear notch of the ulna articulates with the trochlea of the humerus. Remember, that was the trochlea was one of the condyles of the humerus. So the ulna will articulate with the trochlear notch of the humerus. What connects the ulna and the radius is called the interosseous membrane. Interosseous membrane. And these are oriented in such a way to keep uh, to make sure that the ulna, the ulna is properly positioned next to the radius. So there, the fibers are kind of slanted upward from the ulna to the radius. And uh, again, these are just ligaments, right? Ligaments connect bone to bone. And you could test yourself. What are ligaments made out of? So like what type of connective tissue is this interosseous membrane made out of? And the answer would be, dense regular connective tissue, right? Dense regular connective tissue. So this is really important. I could talk a lot more about the interosseous membrane, um, but this allows a lot of the force, right? It allows our elbow joints to share the load and reducing the wear and tear that one would have to bear on the joints, on one joint alone. The interosseous membrane also serves as an attachment for some of our forearm muscles. Finally, the third part of the upper limb is the hand. And each hand has 27 bones in the carpal regions, the metacarpal regions, and the phalanges. We'll start with the carpal bones. So the carpal bones are the bones of the wrist. There are two rows, and these are eight bones altogether. And these eight bones allow movements of flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. We'll talk a lot about those in the next chapter. So the wrist bones allow for uh, all the movements that we can do with the wrist, right? We can go, we can bend it forward or back. Uh, we can bring it toward the midline of the body, away from the midline. It could go almost in any direction. So the carpal bones are our wrist bones. Those are eight irregularly shaped bones, kind of sesamoid shaped. Metacarpal bones are bones of the palm. So if you look at the palm of your hand, we have uh, five metacarpal bones. We have metacarpal one is the thumb, right? We call it metacarpal one is proximal to the base of the thumb. Metacarpal five is proximal to the base of the little finger. All right, so we name our metacarpals one through five. Finally, we have phalanges, which are bones of the finger. And phalanges, um, the thumb specifically only has two phalanges, a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx. But every other um, phalanx, right? Phalanx is singular, phalange is plural. I should make that distinction. Um, so fingers have three phalanges. They have a proximal phalanx, a middle phalanx, and a distal phalanx. And the way we name them is based on which um, metacarpal they're attached to. So for example, we would say that this is middle phalanx three. This is distal phalanx four. Right? This is proximal phalanx five. So just be familiar with how we label um, metacarpals and the phalanges. You don't have to know all the names of the carpal bones. You should be familiar with them, but I'm not going to test you on them. So now let's look at our uh, virtual 3D skeleton to look at the upper limb. So here we have our humerus. You know the humerus articulates with both the ulna and the radius. This is the radius. You know that because it's closest to the thumb. And we know that the ulna is just medial to the radius. And again, note the points of attachment, right? Notice that trochlea. And then we have the carpal bones of the wrist. I could zoom in a little bit more. So here we have those eight carpal bones of the wrist. These are metacarpals. We name them 
uh, closest to the thumb is number one, two, three, four, five. And then we have our phalanges. Distal, middle, proximal. And that's to be metacarpal three and then carpal bones. And of course the same thing happens on this side. And this is the olecranon of the ulna. The olecranon. Right. And you can kind of see how the radius and ulna uh, kind of link up. But you can see these condyles from the humerus and the ulna right, are very tightly articulated. That's the trochlea. This is the trochlea. And that's the capitulum of the humerus. So now let's discuss the pelvic girdle. And the pelvic girdle is composed of three bones. Two coxal bones. A coxal bone is a hip bone. This is one hip bone. Here's another hip bone. And the sacrum, which we know is also part of the vertebral column. So the pelvic girdle consists of this complete ring of bones, the two coxal bones and the sacrum. The pubic symphysis, the pubic symphysis is the interpubic disc of fiber cartilage that joins uh, the two coxal bones anteriorly. So when we say the pelvis, the pelvis is the pelvic girdle, plus all the ligaments and muscles that line the pelvic cavity and the pelvic floor. So the pelvic girdle is the ring of bones. The pelvis is the pelvic girdle plus all the ligaments and muscles that line the pelvic cavity and form its floor. So the pelvic girdle supports the trunk on the lower limbs and encloses and protects the viscera of the pelvic cavity, specifically our colon, urinary bladder, and our reproductive organs. So coxal bones are interesting. This is one coxal bone. Here is another coxal bone. And then these two coxal bones are attached to the sacrum in this picture. The coxal bone is actually composed of three different parts, the ilium, ischium, and the pubis. Um, so three childhood bones, the ilium, ischium, and the pubis all fuse together by adulthood. And each hip bone, each coxal bone is consisting of these three parts. The ilium is shown here, the ilium, and we have the iliac crest, which is the superior crest of the hip. Again, serves for muscle attachment. We'll talk about that a lot next time. We have the acetabulum. The acetabulum is basically the hip socket. That's where the femur can articulate with, the acetabulum. So here's a nice view of the acetabulum. We then have the obturator foramen, the obturator foramen, which are these large holes below uh, the acetabulum, right? So these are some things that you should be familiar with. We have the obturator foramen, we have the acetabulum, which is the hip socket, and we have the iliac crest. So those are some distinctive features of the coxal bone. So going into a little more detail of the pelvis and the pelvic girdle, we have the ilium, we said, is one of the major bones, the largest, um, and it extends from the iliac crest to the center of the acetabulum. The ischia um, is the posterior portion. It's the most inferior and posterior portion of the hip. It's the part that you sit on. Um, and it has a very heavy body because it supports so much weight uh, with a very prominent spine. And specifically, I want you to know the ischial tuberosity. The ischial tuberosity is a point of attachment for the gluteus maximus muscles. The pubis is the third portion of the pelvic bone, the pubic bone specifically. The pubis is the most anterior portion, and the ha has three portions to it. It has the body, superior ramus, and the inferior ramus. Um, and you can see that the pubic symphysis is where the two pubic bones join. And this is fibrocartilage, so it's not too flexible. 
So again, taken together, we have the ilium. This is the iliac crest. Here's the pubic synthesis. Acetabulum, this is where the, the hip bone, uh, the femur will um, form a socket. This is called a pelvic inlet. Right? That's kind of marked by the, the opening of the pelvic girdle. So, so far, I think you should be pretty familiar with the pelvic girdle. And as you'd expect, there are some differences between male and female pelvic girdles. Uh, specifically in males, there is a more narrow subpubic angle compared to in females, there's a much wider subpubic angle. The male also has a lot heavier and thicker pelvic girdle. The female has a lot more wider and shallower pelvic girdle. So in females, there needs to have been adaptations to the needs of pregnancy and childbirth. So we need a larger pelvic inlet and outlet for the passage of an infant's head. So by looking at a skeleton, one of the ways to determine the sex of that human was to look at the pelvis. So here we have a look at the pelvic girdle. Here we have the ilium. In back, we have the ischium. And then toward the front, we have our pubis bone, which is going to be harder to click. So ilium, pubis, Ischium. Again, on your app, you should be looking at these in 3D. And this whole thing is the pelvic girdle, right? Sacrum and the coxal bone. This whole thing is one coxal bone. I just want to make sure that's clear. Ischium, ilium, and pubis make up one coxal bone. So now we can move on to the lower limbs. So the lower limb is divided into three regions, just like the upper limb. And just like the upper limb, it's divided into 30 bones per limb. So we have the thigh or the femoral region that extends from the hip to the knee, right? And that has one bone, uh, the femur, and the patella is kind of uh, in between, I would say the thigh and the leg proper. So from the knee to the ankle, we have the leg proper, also called the crural region. The anterior of the leg proper is called the crural region. The posterior of the leg proper is called the sural region, S-U-R-A-L. Um, so we have two bones in the leg proper. We have the tibia, which is medial, like closer to the midline of the body. And then we have the lateral fibula. So just like we have the radius, um, we have the tibia and we have like the ulna, we have the fibula. They're kind of analogous, right? And the femur is kind of like the humerus. So you should make these kinds of connections. And finally, the third region of the lower limb is the foot. The tarsal region is the union of the crural region with the foot, right? It's the ankle. The tarsal bones are the ankle bones. We have the metatarsal bones, right? Those form the foot. We have five metatarsals, and then we have phalanges, again, just like we did in the hand. So let's start off with the femoral region, or the thigh, which features the femur. And the femur is the longest and strongest bone of the body and measures about one quarter of your entire height. Uh, notably, the head of the femur articulates with the ac acetabulum of the pelvis, right? So this articulates with the hip socket. The fovea capitis is a little pit in the head of the femur uh, that helps it attach to the acetabulum through a ligament. We have two interesting aspects of the femur that aren't found in other bones called trochanters. There's a greater trochanter and a lesser trochanter. These are again, just massive bony processes that are insertions for the powerful muscles of the hip. We have medial and lateral condi uh, epicondyles that are found distally. Uh, these you can actually feel very easily at the knee. So you can feel these two um, wide points sticking out of your femur at the knee. We have the patella or the kneecap is a sesamoid bone, look like a triangle almost. 
and this joins at the patellar surface of the femur. Right, so the patellar surface is where the, uh, the, the patella can articulate with the femur to form the kneecap. So now moving on to the crural region or the leg proper, we have two bones, the tibia and the fibia. The tibia is the medial thicker of the two bones that actually supports the weight of the cruel region. We have the medial um, and lateral condyles that articulate with the condyles of the femur. So up here, these condyles will uh, articulate with the femur right up here. We have the tibial tuberosity, which is an important prominent um, protrusion. And this is where the patellar ligament will attach. And this is really important for the quadriceps to work. So the tibial tuberosity is where the uh, patellar ligament can attach to, which is a continuation of the quadriceps tendon. And this will make a lot more sense when we talk about the muscular system. But right now, you should remember the tibial tuberosity um, serves as a point of attachment to the patellar ligament. We then have the fibula, which is a lot more slender uh, than the tibia and it helps stabilize the ankle. It does not bear any of the body's weight. And in fact, you can actually remove part of the fibula and use it to replace any missing bone elsewhere in the body. Um, it's, joined by, it's joined to the tibia by this interosseous membrane, right? very similar to the radius and ulna. We'll then go to the foot. Tarsal bones are found in the ankle these are a little different from carpal bones because the ankle has to hold a lot of weight, right? Your wrist bones don't really hold a lot of weight at all, but your ankles have to support your entire body weight. So they're arranged um, in groups similar to the wrist, but the shapes and the arrangement of those bones is a little conspicuous, it's a little different, right? They're fully integrated into the structure of the foot, right? So the foot can really support all that weight. The calcaneus, the calcaneus is the largest tarsal bone that forms the heel. So here's the calcaneus, forms the heel. The distal portion is the attachment for the calcaneal tendon, also known as the Achilles tendon, right? So that comes from the calf muscles. So the calf muscles actually extend all the way down to the calcaneus, to the heel. We then have the talus, which is the most superior tarsal bone. And the talus helps form a joint with the tibia and the fibula. So the talus is a point of attachment for the tibia and the fibula. And this is the second largest tarsal bone. The rest of the foot bones resemble the hand bones in name and arrangement. So we have metatarsals instead of metacarpals, we have metatarsals. One through five, right? We know metatarsal one is proximal to the great toe. The great toe is called the hallux. The, the thumb is called the pollux. Metatarsal five is proximal to the little toe. And of course we have phalanges. Two are in the great toe, proximal and distal. All the other have three, proximal, middle, and distal. And again, we can name this middle phalanx three. This would be distal phalanx two, All right? So just be able to name any of these. So we said there's the tarsal bones, metatarsals, and then phalanges. So let's take a look at our 3D skeleton. So right up here, we see the femur with its head articulating with the acetabulum of the hip bone. Uh, in this image, you can see some of the features. You can see the trochanters actually and then we go down here, we can see the patella, which is that sesamoid bone that makes up the kneecap. And then we have the two bones of the leg proper or the cruel region. We have the medial tibia, which is the weight bearing portion. And then we have that slender fibula, which is lateral. We then said we have the tarsal bones, the calcaneus makes up the heel. The talus is a connecting point for the, um, for the fibula and tibia to attach to the carpal bones.
So you should be familiar with the calcaneus and the talus as part of the tarsal bones. And then of course we have metatarsals, one through five, and then phalanges. We, there's no way to distinguish between, say, this bone, the distal phalanx, distal phalanx two, or distal phalanx two, right? You would have to say it's like this, this is distal phalanx two, right? You would have to say it's of the toe or of the hand. You'd have to specify which phalanx you're referring to. So that is the end of our discussion on the human skeletal system. I wanted to briefly mention how humans, Homo sapiens, are the only animals that can stand on their own two feet. This had to have been due to several adaptations of the human feet, legs, spine, and skull. So let's talk about some of these skeletal adaptations for bipedalism. Right. So 3.6 million year old skeleton uh, fossils show that um, primitive humans walked upright on their own two feet. This could have been advantageous because by walking on two feet, you can stand upright and search, right? You can see predators a lot more easily. You can hunt more easily if you could stand upright. Also by standing on two feet, that frees up your hands so you can carry property. You can make tools more easily. Again, we could go on and on about this. This is very interesting stuff. But very briefly, let's look at some of the specific adaptations that humans have had to undergo um, in the jump from, uh, chimpanzee to homo sapien, which is again, a very big jump. So looking at the feet, apes are flat footed, but humans have arches in their feet that allow us to absorb shock as we walk and as we run. Our tarsal bones are also very tightly articulated with each other compared to um, chimpanzees. So chimps might be more flexible. Um, they have opposable uh, big toes. They could grab onto things a lot more easily. We do not have that ability, right? Our great toe is not uh, opposable, but it is highly developed that we could use our toes to kind of push our bodies forward. If you lose your great toe, it has a tremendous crippling effect on the balance of your whole body. So we actually use our big toes for uh, support. Looking at the femurs of a chimp, you can see that these are nearly vertical. But in humans, they have more of an angle. And this angle places our knees closer together beneath the body's center of gravity. So when we lock our knees when we stand, this allows us to stand with very little muscular effort because our knees are directly below our center of gravity. Apes cannot do this. They cannot stand on two legs for very long without tiring because there's no, it's like, it's just a, a flat, um, not very balanced anchor, right? Where this angle um, allows the most of the body weight to be centered. Uh, so there's less stress um, put on overall. Another interesting uh, difference is in the pelvis. So the abdominal viscera of an ape or another four-legged mammal is supported by the abdominal wall, right? Because they hang down, they crawl. And humans, all the viscera bear down on the pelvic cavity, right? So again, think about this. An ape is hunched over. So all of its organs are kind of in the belly region, right? Uh, but our organ, when we stand upright, all of our organs put weight down. They press down on the pelvis. And that's what explains we have much more of a bowl shaped, right? This can hold all of our organs as we stand upright. And it doesn't put enough, uh, the organs don't put too much weight um, down on our pelvis, All right? So this is important. Uh, we could look at the spinal curvature to see another difference. So whereas chimpanzees have sh like C-shaped spines, we have some lumbar lordosis, right? And this helps us shift the body center of gravity to the rear, right? Slightly above the hip joint where we can support a lot of weight. Because a, uh, chimpanzees have a C-shaped spine, they can't stand as easily, right? Their center of gravity is in front of the hip joint when they stand. So that takes a lot of muscular effort to keep them from falling over. Humans require very little effort to keep their balance, right? So uh, again, another adaptation in standing upright. So that is the end of this chapter. Um, 
refer to the learning map mostly when you're studying uh, to make sure you know how to identify all the bones. Specifically, in an articulated skeleton, in a, a skeleton that's connected, you should be able to identify all the bones in Table 8.1. You must know how to identify any of these following bones on their own if they're not attached to anything. You should be familiar with all the bone markings listing in the learning map as they will be featured on future exams. So it's best to learn these bone markings now, even though I might not test you on them, uh, because when we talk about joints and muscles and muscle attachments, you'll be thankful that you memorize the bone markings. So that is the end of chapter eight. Thank you for listening, and I hope you learned a lot about the skeletal system.